Democracy is not only the rule of the majority, rather it is a way of life. This is at least how American pragmatists see it, and this is the view that's shown through in Kamala Harris's victory speech. In this video, I will talk about three main and important characteristics of um, the American pragmatist approach to the philosophy of democracy. First of all, I will talk about its emphasis on action rather than abstract concepts. Secondly, I will talk about open-endedness. And thirdly, I will speak about how American pragmatists view democracy as relevant to everyday life. So at the very beginning of her speech, um, Kamala Harris states, Congressman John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, before his passing, wrote, democracy is not a state, it is an act. And what he meant was that America's democracy is not guaranteed. It is only as strong as our willingness to fight for it. Democracy is not a state, it is an act. This statement is already a good example of the American pragmatist emphasis on action. John Dewey is probably the most famous proponent of American pragmatism. Josiah Ober, who builds onto the works of Dewey, states, for instance, democracy is the capacity of the public to do things. So democracy is not only majoritarianism, it is not the, that the state has to do what the majority has imposed on it. Uh, rather, there's a much more fundamental and deeper sense to um, democracy, namely that it enables frameworks for various fragmented members of the public and the publics to formulate shared goals and to find ways to act together. And John Dewey calls this associated activity, which is fundamental to democracy. Now this capacity to do things together, to act together, to formulate shared goals together, is fairly crucial in a country as polarized as the United States, where the Trump supporters and Biden, Harris supporters on the other side seem to be living on two totally different planets. And this is uh, often confirmed in studies which show that, for instance, social media feeds, feeds of Republicans and Democrats have entirely different contents. So they are always confirmed in their beliefs when they follow the news. The German philosopher Hans Joas is also rooted in the pragmatist tradition and um, he thinks that there is an essential link between creativity and democracy because democracy enables this openness of action. Um, he says that in a democracy there is no prefabricated goals that the country just has to follow step by step, rather there is a freedom to develop goes on the way to act and through acting creatively articulate what it is that we want and to find or clarify shared goals on the way. This takes me to my second point, namely the open-endedness of democracies. Democracies do not have goals that are set in stone. Rather, their characteristic feature is that they enable people and various peoples to formulate their will, so they allow the freedom and the leeway to do this as opposed to already having um, an agenda in mind. A good example of this open-endedness is that democracies, per definition, need to make room for, for movements that brought to the fore issues that were hitherto not as prominent in mainstream media and thought. So it is necessary that there is room for such movements and that there is room for people to bring forth issues that are important to them to be discussed in the public sphere. As Jan Werner Müller, a political theorist at Princeton, has stated, democracy is unthinkable without rules that are based on and in turn enable freedom and equality, but it does not necessarily produce a particular content. As James Fearon has stated, democracy is a kind of institutionalized uncertainty. So this kind of indeterminacy, uncertainty about what it is that we will want tomorrow as a country is built into the system of democracy. It is institutionalized. 
And needless to say, for this kind of open-endedness to work, the public needs to be able to express its will uh, without fearing violence. And as Michael Hampe has argued in his recent book, The Third Enlightenment, it is a part of our legacy of enlightenment that we expect our societies to be able to deliberate without experiencing violence from above, from the state. This is a premise that we take for granted, but obviously not everybody experiences it this way. And this takes me to the third point, democracy's relevance for everyday life. So John Dewey thinks that democracies should be rooted in schools. So it is in schools that people learn the kind of habits of participative thinking that are necessary for democracy. And it is also necessary for a democracy that its citizens are well educated and are able to participate in deliberations and discussions that lead to major decisions being made in the country. Also, Dewey thinks that democracy starts in neighborhoods. It is not only something that is um, exercised at the level of the government and the law. For instance, when you and your neighbors want to prevent an old tree from being cut down in your neighborhood, and you, you start a campaign against this. This is an example of an act of democracy in miniature. Now this understanding of democracy is premised on a strong um, public sphere or civil society. So the existence of a public that's separate from the power um, that reigns and that is able to critique and act as a kind of tribunal on the power, on the established governmental power. And this is also not something we can take for granted, but it is a historical development into something that Charles Taylor has called a modern social imaginary. He calls it the imaginary because it is not yet fully realized, even in the Western world. But it is something that shapes our understanding of how a society should be. It is essential for a democracy that information and knowledge is able to circulate freely and that citizens have access to all the information they need to make informed decisions, which is why, for instance, education is so important. Now, this might seem like a very idealized and unrealistic uh, picture of modern democracies. However, it is not meant as a description of the state of affairs, rather as an ideal. It is already 1927 that John Dewey diagnoses a certain apathy in the American public and he considers this apathy to stem from some individual's difficulty in finding their political place in society in the widest sense that they do not see how they fit in, in, the, social, in the common sphere and in the political discussions taking place and they do not see themselves represented, for instance. And this difficulty and this fragmentation of the public is even more extreme today when a lot of Trump supporters, for instance, uh, do not feel themselves heard or represented and have not found their political place in the society. So to come back to Harris's statement, democracy is not a state, it is an act. With what, what we have learned about American pragmatists, we may even say it is an activity. It is an activity of integrating all these different and fragmented voices into the public deliberation and the democratic process. And it is a very difficult task that Biden and Harris now have in front of them in this very polarized and fragmented United States that we have today.